Greetings, everyone, and thank you for joining me today on our Kelly Appeal TV, where we discuss the appeal of Robert Sylvester Kelly, where it's headed, and from where it began. This is what I would like to discuss with you today, the makers, the shakers of the music industry. I ran into an interview that I feel relates to the great voices of the music and movie industry. Someone left me an email and asked me to do some background investigation on Sony and in relationship to Robert Sylvester Kelly, what was going on after the muting of R. Kelly. And when we say mute R. Kelly, it wasn't just because of the, the charges that were brought forth, but because they were muting him and his music because they were moving over, Sony was moving over into a platform of live streaming, Apple and Spotify um, platforms. So this video comes from Sony Entertainment, archive date 2015 in relation to Doug Morris. And Doug Morris is someone that should be introduced on the R. Kelly channel. Well, Doug Morris, Born November 23rd, 1938, is an American record executive. He is the current chairman of 12 Play. Oh, sorry. He is the chair, current chairman of 12 Tone Music Group. He previously served as a chairman and the CEO of the Universal Music Group from 1995 to, to 2011 and Sony Music Entertainment from 2011 to 2017 part of all the major music industry companies in the world, including the new universal company that's worth over $15 billion at this point in America as of April 15th, 2022. Universal, Sony, industry, the chairman, CEO, 12-tone music group, Founder of Vivo, Motown, Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, Billboard, Sony, songwriter. And so this is why we should listen to this video because there is a lot of intricate facts that come from the Sony industry during the time that R. Kelly was part of Sony, um, moving from Jive Records, moving into Atlantic Records, and moving into the arena of Robert Sylvester Kelly's 30-year career. And so we're going to discuss some things that we're going to hear today. And I definitely want you to keep a keen ear out for things that we can connect that's related to why R. Kelly was totally muted, okay? And it was not about his music, as he said on the Gayle King interview. They were trying to kill him from a viewpoint of his musical career. And in doing that, they went so far as to be as dirty as shedding him all the way down. I would also like to add that Billboard did a article on September 28, 2018, Hannah Carp Music News. As Doug Morris builds new label, former employers question cost of his loyalty to protege. Well, I believe that a lot of people have been stepped on in order to get this group of people where they are today in the world. And um, it's just really sad that R. Kelly was a part of this cost, you know, because now we as the fans and the supporters and the, the viewers of this wonderful singer, now we're stuck. We're stuck. Also, according to Universal, January 18th, 2019, Kelly last spring exclusive Universal Music Publishing Group has quietly dropped R. Kelly from its roster. The New York Times reported 
that um, on January 18, 2019, Sony Music Entertainment and its subsidiary label RCA Records have dropped R. Kelly from their roster and will not issue new releases from the singer as Billboard, Variety, and the New York Times report. So R. Kelly was part of the industries of major music companies that Doug Morris was part of. So just wanted you to know that for your information. Well, good morning. It's a great pleasure to be here. Um, and it's also, of course, a great pleasure to be able to introduce uh, Doug Morris. Um, Doug is the current CEO uh, of Sony Music Entertainment, uh, the world's second largest music company. Um, but Doug has also run all the music labels, I think basically all the music labels that have ever existed, but essentially the, certainly the three largest ones. So uh, in addition to Sony, also Universal and Warner. Um, in addition to that, he's a songwriter, uh, a member of the Songwriters Hall of Fame. Um, he's also one of the most influential, uh, regularly cited as the most influential. He's worked with just such huge legendary names in the industry. Uh, the list is a, a, it's a roll call of the greats. Um, if you think about Adele, uh, Beyonce, Fleetwood Mac, uh, Alicia Keys, <clears throat> uh, Bruce Springsteen, the Rolling Stones, Pete Townsend, Led Zepp, U2. The list is so impressive uh, and it's a great pleasure to be uh, um, here with you. Um, and if that's not enough, uh, he's also an honorary doctor. So I'm going to call him Dr. Doug throughout the course of today. Uh, uh, he's an honorary doctor from the Berklee College of Music in recognition of his achievements and influence in music and also for his, um, his enduring contributions to American and international culture. So uh, let's just welcome Doug Morris. Doug. Thank you. Before we start today, I just want to wish a happy birthday to my colleague, Antonio L.A. Reed. Do you want to stand up for a second? Stand up. Now, as you can see, he is a very strong, aggressive man. His conversation starts off with the introduction. He doesn't say thank you. He doesn't acknowledge the um, interviewer. And then he takes the interview off on his own. Okay. Okay. So let's see who L.A. Reed is. According to Wikipedia, Antonio Marquise L.A. Reed, born June 7th, 1956, is an American record executive, A&R representative, and record producer. He is the founder and serves as co-chairman of Hitchco Entertainment, he also previously served as the chairman and CEO of Epic Records and Island Def Jam Music Group, which is part of uh, Arista Records. He's also part of the Arista Records and the Def Jam and all of the hip hop industry came um, and took over the R&B sector. Between him, L.A. Reid and Doug Morris, hip hop became essential to the music industry. L.A. And, and I have worked together for at least 10, 12 years, and he's one of the outstanding creative uh, entrepreneurs in the entire industry and a very close friend and personal friend of mine. So happy birthday, L.A. <clears throat> right. Yes, um, sir. Ruben. <laughs> you so didn't know what to start. <laughs> Let me start at the beginning. It's always a good place to start um, uh, with your background and early career uh, in the music business. Um, so you came from you come from a professional family background. Um, your father was a lawyer. Uh, your mother a ballet dancer and a teacher. Yes. And your brother was a scientist. Yes. Um, so I'm not quite sure how to put this delicately, but how did you come to choose the music industry, which is anything, uh, or certainly in the 1950s, was anything uh, apart from a recognized profession? Well, I'm one of the lucky ones because I think that the music business chose me. Uh, from my earliest memories, I remember loving the, the music of that moment. 
the music that was sweeping across the United States was music by Chuck Berry, uh, Fats Domino, uh, Little Richard, Jerry Lee Lewis. It was exciting, sexy kind of music, very different than what had preceded it. It was just fascinating to me, and it was very simplistic in its chord structure. <clears throat> it was basically CFG chords, and that's all you really had to know. So I used to go to the piano in our living room, and I demolished that piano, because I would bang away at those CFG chords, and I would put a top line on them with certain lyrics, <clears throat> always singing about girls and things like that. And I consider myself somewhat of a songwriter, the songwriter with no success. And um, I did that for years. I'd walk around with uh, a tape recorder. And of course, my, my parents were very worried about it. I thought till I was 16 years old, uh, my middle name was, who's going to take care of Doug? <laughs> So what was, your first, what was your first job in the music industry? Um, I got a job with a famous publisher named Lou Levy, uh, Leeds Music, and he paid me uh, $25 a week to come and write songs. <clears throat> but it was great because I was in college and I'd go down to his publishing company, which had a recording studio on the back, and I'd sit there and they would record them, and that was the best part of the whole day for me. And of course there's a lovely link with Lou Levy because... Uh, there's a lovely link with Lou Levy because the Epic Records link, of course, is there. Oh, that was very funny. He, um, he introduced me to a gentleman by the name of Jim Fogelson, who actually was a very well-known um, A&R executive. And lo and behold, he signed me. And the next thing I knew, I was down in Nashville making a record with the Jordan Ayers, each of whom could sing better than me. And we put the record out. It was a great experience because I learned a certain commonality with all artists that helped me later in my career. Um, and the record came out, it was on Epic Records, which actually LA runs today under our umbrella. <laughs> That's hilarious. And uh, that record can still be found on eBay. I, I went and bought myself a copy 40 years later. 40 years later, it's worth $5. <clears throat> For those of you who want to go and buy it, it's called Frigid Digit, apparently. Oh. Now, that led you into, um, so you then, of course, uh, after college, you got drafted and you mm -hmm. came to France uh, with the army, um, uh, where also you met your wife. I, I did. Think. Um, so that was a I went to the military career. police for two years and spent two wonderful years here in France. And, uh, of course, I met my wife and we've been married since. And that was a great experience. And, and then you went back and uh, took a job with Robert Mellon. Robert Mellon was another, uh, was a publisher at 1650 Broadway, and <clears throat> I got a job with him taking my songs around and a gentleman named Bert Burns' songs around to different record companies in the hopes that someone would record one of them. That's how it was done then. They were professional, they were professional men, they were called. And in, that, in the course of doing that, uh, one of the companies I visited, a small company called Lori Records, asked me to come work for them in the A&R department. And it was an interesting company because they had artists like uh, Gary U.S. Bonds, Dion and the Belmonts, the Chiffons. It was all that kind of shuffle kind of music, all of the records. And uh, I learned a great deal there. <clears throat> and um, you talk a bit about Lorry Records. Um, tell us about the... Um successes that you've had there at Laurie Records. Tell us about that. Well, the first one was a lot of fun because I wrote a song called Are You a Boy or Are You a Girl with my brother, my brother the scientist, which he loves to this day. And it was a minor hit, so two, three hundred thousand copies, but it was really exciting because they were playing it in the big stations around the country. And in those days, my wife will remember this vividly. I bought one of these huge transistor radios and I'd actually take it to bed with me because I could hear the radio being played at WRKO in Boston. These were AM stations and WLS in Chicago. And she'd say, you just heard it. Why do you want to hear it again? Doesn't it sound the same to you? I said, no, it doesn't. <laughs> and then you tell the story about some um uh, the single uh, Laurie 3380. Um, this well, is, this is was, a little yes. bit of soul, correct? Yes, well, I had some success at Laurie, so they were starting to let me um, 
sign records. I, I produced and, and I wrote a record with the Chiffons that was a big record, Sweet Talking Guy. And then some producers came in and I leased a record from them uh, called Little Bit of Soul by the Music Explosion, which I always refer to as Laurie 3380. So when you lease a record, that means it's not yours. You lease a record and um, so what he's saying here is during this time, the industry was moving into the gender specific or the gay, bisexual, transgender world. They were moving into the love, grinding, bumping, shaking, all that you know, um, dance routine into the transgender world. That's why the first song he comes out and speaks about is, are you a boy or are you a girl? Now, also, I want you to pay attention to how the Laurel program, the Laurel leasing of this album came to be and how much mu how much money the music industry prior to him made until he was smart enough to catch on. Let's listen. And that really set the, it set the road for me to travel where I really learned the record business and what the record business was truly about. And it happened, I came in one day and there was, the sales manager was a guy named Maurice Singer. And you would think he'd sit there, I vividly remember him sitting at his desk with a cigar taking the orders, hundreds of single orders, thousands and thousands of single orders, tens of thousands. And one day I walk in and there's 300 piece order of Lori 3380s. I wow, my first order on this. And I asked Murray, what does this mean? And he said, he sort of dismissed me. And he said, it's nothing, it's a nothing. It's a chute box order, it's a nothing. But I was very curious. And I looked and I saw that it had been ordered from a distributor in Baltimore called uh, Schwartz Brothers. And I went back to my office and I was curious to find out what it meant. So I called Schwartz Brothers and I asked for the guy in the back room. And I said, listen, I just see you have ordered 300 Lori 3, 3380. What's the reason? And he said, I have two stores in Cumberland, Maryland. I've never heard of Cumberland, Maryland, that ordered 100 pieces each. I said, wow. And then I said, why'd they do that? Logic kicks in. So I found out the name of the stores. It was Vandegrift and Sears. And I called Sears and I asked for the person who sold the records over the counter. And it was a young lady. And I said, you ordered 100 pieces of the Little Bit of Soul record. Why is that? She said, I had 100 kids on Sunday looking for it. So the next logical step is, well, how do they know about it? And she said, the local station WCUM is playing it. I said, wow. So I called the local station, WCUM, and I asked for the music director. And his name, I still vividly remember, his name was Jeff Henderson. And I got him on the phone and I said, you're playing this record? He says, I put it on because I liked it. And it's my one, number one request record already. And I'm getting calls from all over the state for the record. And I said, oh my God, I got a hit, I got a hit. And I brought that information to my bosses who put the money into it to start promoting it. And the record actually went to number two in Billboard and sold uh, several million records. And in doing so, I really had taken the cover off the mystery of what the record business is. Now that is R. Kelly's story in and of itself. That is how he was promoted. That is how he went out, you know, distributing and advertising his videos, um, or not videos, but um, audio. So, you know, he could get on the record label as a young guy moving into the 90s. And this is how the system runs. But wait until you hear about the streaming. Let's listen. If you really think about it, it's quite a simple business. You have a magic piece of product. Someone plays it or exposes it, and if people like it, guess what they do? They go and they try to buy it, and they want to hear it again. So with that information, it opened up a whole new world for me. It was that simple. So to me, that story is, I mean, it's fascinating hearing that because um, it shows this uh, uh, sort of insistent curiosity that you've got and this perseverance as well and also what you call this pursuit of logic um, 
How important are those traits, the, the persistence, the curiosity, um, and that following the logic? How important is that in today's music market for people in the business today? I think in any business, uh, that's what it's about. Something happens, you want to mind, you want to know why did that happen, and what caused it to happen, and what's going to happen next. And if you know, it's really important to think that way. Some people, it's also simple, keep it simple. Sometimes people go A to B to C to D, but some people go A to C to B to D, and they get all caught up in the cobwebs, and they never get to the end. If you keep it simple and just go from one step to the other, you may find out a lot of things that will surprise you. So, having worked for these other companies, you then took the step to set up your own business. And you I did. It, uh, and you called it Big Tree Records. Um, I did. Why did you call it Big Tree Records? I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, well, why do you tell us about the label? I beg your pardon? Tell us about Big Tree, then. Well, I've seen what happened at Lori just by following logic. And, you know, at that moment, I really understood the music and... Um, that was fortunate for me. And I went in with my friend, Dick Vanderbilt, and we set up this small company, the two of us. And I would sign the records, and he would promote the records. And we had a lot of hits. I went in the studio, and I recorded. I wrote and recorded this song, Smoking in the Boys' Room, which was a very big hit. Um, we had You Sexy Thing by Hot Chocolate, which I got from Mickey Most in England. Uh, with the biggest one was I'd Really Love to See You Tonight by England Dan and John Ford Coley. And, but I was still on the wrong track. And by the wrong track, I meant I was still putting out singles and I was promoting songs. I mean, I remember one of the dumbest things I've ever done. I regret it to this day. The first big hit on the label was called Me and You and a Dog Named Boo. And the artist and writer of the song was a gentleman named Kent Lavoy. And I said, Kent, why don't you change your name to Lobo? This is about a dog, you know, maybe it works. You'll be Lobo and we'll have a dog called Me and You and a Dog Named Boo. I ruined him. <laughs> he had to go the rest of his life with a dog's name. <laughs> <laughs> and that, that was really a, a sad lesson. It was a mistake. I was in the singles business, and uh, I've learned from that. And that, of course, um, you came across a, uh, a record label called Capricorn Records. Well, Capricorn had one artist. We had four or five things on the charts, and they had one artist called the Alban Brothers Band who sold millions of albums. And they were much, they were much more respected than we were. So I said, uh-oh, I'm on the wrong, wrong train. Right. So what happened next? Let me think. Well, I had the label for about eight or nine, about seven or eight years, and we did very well. We had a lot of hits. And then one day, I put out a record called White Lies, Blue Eyes by an act named Bullet. And I get a call from one of the most famous people in the record industry, Ahmet Erdogan, who was the founder, the co with Jerry Wexler, of Atlantic Records. And he called me up, and... Um, I said, hi. And he said, what are you doing putting out my record? I said, I beg your pardon? He said, this record that just popped on the charts at number 80, White Lies, Blue Eyes, that's my record. I said, no, it's not your record. It's my record. I said, no, it's my record. I said, I'm coming over and I'm bringing my contract. So Hamid came over to my office and he had a contract which showed he had the record. Now, I had a lawyer had leased me the same record. So there we are. I have my little company in here. So here we go. In the industry, when people lease things to people, like time, like careers, they're only leasing that spot for a moment until, like he says, if we keep it simple, A, B, C, D versus B, C, A, D, we will see that the industry changes and you'll recognize through his interview, he doesn't really come up until he gets with the brothers of the industry of Def Jams, but let's, or Def, um, um, Death Row Records. Let's listen. This is one of the great music men in the world uh, with the same record. So it was an interesting conversation and, uh, <laughs> 
And uh, we ended up, he shipped his record on top of my record, thereby killing both records. But it was very interesting because the next week, um, the president of Atlantic, Jerry Greenberg, called me up and said, uh, Mr. Ertikin, we'd like to see you in his office tomorrow. And I said, well, tell Mr. Ertikin I'll be there exactly when he wants me to be. <laughs> and uh, I went to his office and he said, look, I'm, I'm very impressed with your label. and I'd like you to, to buy your label and I'd like you to come one of the divisions of Atlantic. I was so excited. I thought my clothes were to catch fire. It was just a great moment. And he did. And he put me in charge of a, uh, there's a funny label, it was called Atco Records. And Atco was supposed to be responsible for two major rock and roll labels. It was Swan Song, which was Led Zeppelin, and Rolling Stone Records, which was the Rolling Stones. And I came in there with a background of uh, Lobo and me and you and a dog named Boo. So it was a... <laughs> So I said, I better change my whole thing. So I grew a beard and I bought a big gold watch. But I found that that really doesn't matter. You better know your stuff. <laughs> and that was a great period for me because we also signed Axe. And in those two, three years at Atco were extraordinary because I went to England and I signed Pete Townsend. We did a solo album, Empty Glass. And I signed Stevie Nicks. And we had a huge album with Belladonna, a, an artist called Gary Newman with the song Here in My Car. And it was just one hit in, in excess out of Australia. And that was a lot of fun. When everything you put out is a hit, it's really exciting, as opposed to when you don't. <laughs> and of course, this also put you in touch with Jimmy Iovine, who's been a... Well, it was. That was a, a great moment. So I wanted someone to produced Stevie and Jimmy was this emerging as one of, as a great young producer. He had produced Tom Petty, he had worked with um, John Lennon, Bruce Springsteen and he was really on an arc to greatness. And I called him up and I, I said, listen, I'd like you to produce this Stevie Nicks solo album. I said, I'd rather produce the Rolling Stones. And I said, I understand you would, so would I, but you're going to produce Stevie Nicks. <laughs> And he came, and he went out there, and he produced her solo record. So I was very good friends with Stevie, and I called her up after the first two weeks, and I, I called her at her house to find out how she was doing. <clears throat> and Jimmy answered the phone. I said, hey, Jimmy, can I talk to Stevie? And he said, she's sleeping. So I said, ah, so what are you doing there? And that's when I realized if you're going to work with Jimmy, you've got to be ready that he's always going to get a little something extra. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the true story, right? <laughs> so tell us a bit about Jimmy and his, uh, his family life, his background. Um... Well, Jimmy's, Jimmy's an extraordinary person. Um, he comes from Red Hook, Brooklyn. His father was a stevedore. And I think his mother did the numbers. But um, it's very interesting because he's really a product of his dad. If Jimmy would get up early in the morning and make breakfast and make an omelet, his dad would come in and say, that's the best omelet I've ever seen. No one can make an omelet like Jimmy. I don't know if that's true, but his dad thought so. And then he'd say to his dad, can you believe... I'm going to work with John Lennon tomorrow. And you know what the dad said? Lucky John. <laughs> now, when you got someone like that behind you, or a mentor like that who's with you, it gives you the confidence to go out and destroy the world. And that's what Jimmy has. He's got an enormous talent. Now, at this point, you can look at R. Kelly and see the love that his mother, Joanne, Kelly gave to him to do beyond and above what even his brothers were capable of doing. And they started way earlier in the game. The reason I'm going on with the story, I know it's very mundane, um, but we need to listen to how Sony built itself up, how the chairman was thinking, where the chairman came from and why he made the decisions in which he did. Because when we get later into the video, we're going to see what Apple, Spotify, and Sony has to do with uh, the R. Kelly situation. But um, 
Let's keep listening. Intellect and a great belief in his own ability. And um, now tell us about the. Um, so I mean, there's we could spend an entire session talking about Jimmy, of course, which we're not going to do. We're, we're talking about you. But just yeah. tell us in particular about how you and Jimmy came to spot the potential for rap music, which of course was quite challenging um, at the time. Yes, I had signed the first one. I had signed. You know, I was first taken aback by the lyrics and the misogyny of the rap music. <clears throat> then I saw all the little independent record companies buying them and selling them. And being a big advocate of the First Amendment, I, I followed uh, and started signing rap artists. And the first one I signed was Two Live Crew, which I got in a lot of trouble for. They actually got arrested down in Miami for selling their music. And um, we convinced Bruce Springsteen to let us turn Born in the USA into Band in the USA. And it was a great moment. And I, I really uh, got taken up with it. But Jimmy, who has certain kind of ability to almost. OK, I need to stop here because now do you see why the R&B of music that was taking up the, the 60s, 70s and 80s was getting ready to be replaced by the 90s and 2000s music changing. The music was changing right before our eyes and we were still listening to R. Kelly because R. Kelly was just coming on the scene. But what happened was they didn't have any room to place R. Kelly in there. And that's why I believe he had to fight so hard to get into the game because they were moving out of R&B into hip hop and into, you know, the next genre of music. And he was holding back the ability to move forward with the hip hop industry because now he's coming out and everybody's loving him and nobody really signed him in. He forced his way into the music industry. And sometimes when we're not welcome, we need to learn to stay within the remains and the, the areas in which we are welcomed because situations like R. Kelly will come to pass. So let's keep going. Jimmy, who has certain kind of ability to almost see around corners, he called me up and he said, you know, this stuff is going mainstream. We really have to get into it. So I said, what do you suggest? He said, well, I met this guy. I want you to come out and meet him with me <clears throat> and tell me what you think. I said, who's the guy? And he said, his name is Suge Knight. I said, okay, Suge Knight. So we're going to meet Suge Knight. He said, yes. So we met him in a fancy little restaurant in California, a restaurant called the Ivy. And Suge Knight came to lunch. And Suge Knight was a former gangbanger out of Compton, a member of the Bloods. When I met him, I said, oh, my God, this guy has the biggest chest I've ever seen. <laughs> He's about 280, with a cap pulled down. And... After everything else was said and done, I must say, a brilliant record man. Brilliant, brilliant record executive. And he had... I believe Shook nice Knight is incarcerated right now as well. Could someone... I'm, I'm going to look, look that up. I'm not really into that much hip-hop. But yes, I do believe that he is incarcerated at this time as well. This label... I wasn't crazy about the name of it, but it was called Death Row Records. <laughs> and uh, their, they had, their symbol was a guy in an electric chair being strapped in. <laughs> and it was sort of out of our culture for the moment. But um, he says, listen, we're going to go to this restaurant and talk to this guy. Now, Jimmy weighs about 120. Shug weighs, he was a former football player of the L.A. Rams. He weighs about 280. And they were sitting next to each other in the restaurant, and I was sitting across them. And I found it very funny, because they'd, they'd twitch together. You'd see this twitch, and the whole thing moved. And, and Jimmy, <laughs> Jimmy said to me, listen, when I wink at you, it means I'm going to go to the bathroom, and I want you to tell Suge that I'm a genius. <laughs> I said, so you want me to tell Suge you're a genius? And because of that, what's going to happen? We're going to sign Death Row Records. I said, because you're a genius? He said, yes. <laughs> so 
And there he goes off to the bathroom, and I'm sitting there across the way from Shug. And I said, Shug, you know, you're very fortunate. He said, why am I fortunate? I said, you're going to have the chance to work with a genius. Yeah, who's the genius? I said, well, you're one of the geniuses, but the other one is Jimmy. He says, Jimmy's a genius? I said, he's a genius. He said, yeah. And I said, yeah. And this went on and on. <laughs> And finally, I started to sweat, and then Jimmy comes back, and uh, believe it or not, we made that deal, and Interscope picked up the distribution for Death Row Records, which was an amazing moment, because with that label came Dr. Dre, Snoop Dogg, and a myriad of iconic rap artists, and um, that was an incredible moment. So... That was Atlantic. So that what happened? That was yes, the Warner Music Group. The Warner, yeah. So what happened? What happened after Atlantic? Well, I set up a company with with Jimmy and with Ted Fields called Interscope, which is a very very famous record company today. And what what happened when? So um, after Atlantic, you then uh, which what, what so, so so sixteen years you were working with Ahmed, right? Sixteen years I worked. Yes, and, and then I worked in the Edgar next, and MCA I worked in the next and, office from Ahmed Erdogan. Yeah, and then and then after that, Edgar and MCA and well, after that, um, I got fired at the Warner Group. We were um, being bombarded with the rap music. People did not like the misogyny. Washington didn't like it. Um, Jerry Levin got beat up with it, and that meant we got beat up twice as much. And um, a gentleman came into the company, Michael Fuchs, who wanted to run the record division. My whole crew got fired. But it was very interesting because Edgar Brofman actually owned 15% of the entire uh, Warner Communications. And he called me up. And uh, it was a very interesting story. He called me up first and said, Doug, I want you to go see a movie called The, the Shawshank Redemption. And think of me as the guy on the beach. Edgar is a very lovely, soulful man. He had bought all of Music Corporation of America, the entire company, the, the, uh, the movie company, the record company, the, the whole thing. And um, I went to the movie, my wife and I, and he said, I looked at the movie, and, and it ends with this felon, which I guess was me, <laughs> breaking out of prison and getting to the beach and meeting the man on the beach, who was Edgar, and they sailed off to a wonderful life together. I'd like to input in this area right here that many people are ploys to the big businessmen's game. And when it boils down to it, the big businessmen are the ones who ride off into the sunset in the beautiful sun while many are incarcerated and left for dead because they just stepped over them. What are your thoughts here? Um, I was told that a lot of big businessmen, they make box office hits because there are subliminal messages in the movie. And sure enough, Sony chairman just said that technically that was the story. <laughs> that was the story. They, they, they break out of prison, but yet and still... Death Row Records is sitting there incarcerated. <laughs> Amazing. Amazing. At which point he offered me a job running MCA. Now MCA as a music company was known in the industry at that time as the Music Cemetery of America. <laughs> Sincerely, everyone that was, they had very few artists. They had a very good country division, actually. And they had Mary J. Bly and a group called Rush. But that was it. They had about an 8% market share. And Interscope and then Universal? Well, what happened was Jimmy was getting bombed from Washington because he was still putting out these vulgar, misogynistic records. And it was very easy for him to free himself then from the Warner Group. And I was very eager to get him to Universal, it was to MCA, which I didn't, Edgar and I changed the name, to Universal. So there they came, Jimmy ran the West Coast, and I ran the East Coast, called it Universal. And that was the key moment for that Universal. It was a small company before that. Jimmy came over, and within the first 
year and a half, he had uh, the number one, two, three, four albums in the country. And we ran right up to like over a 20% market share. It was an amazing real. And R. Kelly was definitely number one in many of those hits. He sat number one for six weeks. R. Kelly was six weeks in the running with the song that him and Celine Dion did. And it stood six weeks at number one. So R. Kelly did help contribute to the MCA's marketable increase of awareness to their listeners. And that's all he was asking for was some of the royalty back from all the things that he had done um, during his 30 year career. And he wasn't receiving the benefits or the fruits of his labor. Let's listen. We're a 20% market share. It was an amazing, really fun. So what was your strategy at Universal? Well, the strategy was to fill it with urban music. I don't think a record company can really be successful without urban music, the roots of our music. And we had Death Row. Um, we, I bought Def Jam. Um, we acquired Cash Money. And just with those three companies, we probably had 40, 45% of all the urban music in America. That was a, and then all the cool kids wanted to come with us. So it was really fun. So, I mean, it's interesting hearing that because um, it strikes me that you must have thought about a particular culture, about generating a particular culture mm -hmm. at an organization like Universal. Can you talk us through what what culture you tried to bring in? Well, by culture, for me, you know, getting that urban music was was cultural. But I had my own cultural culture about how I ran these companies and have continued to do this through my whole career. And it may sound square to everyone, and no one may believe it, but my whole philosophy about running a company, you could put in one word, two words, be nice, treat people with respect, Make the people who work for you feel great. Make them know that you appreciate what they do. I know when I was coming up, people would degrade you, make you feel bad, send you at home at night, worried about your job. There was one guy who used to say, I want to see you on Monday. I have something to talk to you about. And you knew it was something bad and you worried about it all weekend. Those are cruel people, and I don't want to be involved with people like that. Our companies are based on mutual respect and loyalty to each other, and that works. When you really mean it, and the people who work with you know you really mean it, that they do something special, you pay them a little extra. That the people going out at night, out that door, are your most important asset. That's the culture I believe in. I hate screamers. I hate people who abuse other people. And our companies, the ones that I've been in charge of, that's not tolerated. And uh, that works for me. So R. Kelly should be feeling as though he has been respected in the industry since he is the king of R&B because he's done everything. He's went above and beyond. You think of LL Cool J. LL Cool J was a guy who made, um, I think his 12, 12 albums. That's what he wanted to do in his career. He did that. And then now he's, you don't even really hear too much of LL, but he's still on the scene. He's still there quietly, you know, submerging into his uh, career ship. However, R. Kelly was the, is, is the king of R&B as well. And he wasn't respected. He wasn't given his royalties. He wasn't given his respect. Um, he wasn't even given a handshake to say thank you for a wonderful career, which I know that's what he was looking at because of the way that the powers that be controlled how he was going to go down in history. And it's very sad. But this was the culture that Doug Morris chose to abide by in his long term career since the 1950s. Do you believe that? How many people can we list in um, the top R&B and music industry roll call names that would beg to differ?
So you've had some great partnerships in your career. Um, Ahmed Erdogan, you worked for uh, you, you worked with him for 16, 16 years, and Jimmy Iovine, uh, obviously thirty seven and counting. Um, tell me about that. Well, Ahmed, I don't know if many people know him in the audience, but he was worth knowing. He was one of the most interesting people in the history of the industry. First of all, from a talent perspective, he and his partner Jerry Wexler signed Ray Charles, Aretha Franklin, the Rolling Stones, Led Zeppelin, Crosby, Stills and Nash, and on and on. Atlantic Records was a cool company. I can still see that black and red label in my dreams at night. But he was also a bon vivant. And he loved to have a good time. Let me say it again. He loved to have a good time. <laughs> and anything you read about him, multiply by two. <laughs> so I'll give you an example of our relationship. Every morning we'd come in, there'd be a big high five and a hug. What a way to work. If I play a good record, he'd bang on the wall. We were in adjoining offices for 16 years. If he played a good record, I'd bang on the wall. It was great. And I remember one night, he, uh, a bit of a dandy, he came to my office at about six o'clock and he had on this beautiful tan suit, white shirt, green tie, beautiful brown shoes, the kind that very often you'll wear, L.A. And, <laughs> and he came dancing in and he said, listen, we have a little bit of a problem. I said, what's the problem? He said, Steve Ross, who is the big boss of Water Communication, wants us up in his office at nine o'clock tomorrow. And he wants, and the board is going to be there, the Warner board. Mm. And they want us to have a discussion about our strategy and our tactics how we are going to improve our business next year. I said, oh my. I said, so let's discuss it. He said, don't, don't, don't worry about it. I'll take care of the whole thing. Just be there by nine. And I had a sense of anxiety went through me. <laughs> <laughs> but there it was at nine o'clock and I was up there worried, particularly at nine o'clock when there was no omit. At 9.15, there was no omit. At 9.20, there was Ahmed. But that tan suit that he had worn, he had it on now. He had the same clothes on. <laughs> except he had a huge stain. Where he, he must have dropped a drink on his lapel, and it would go all the way down his pants. <laughs> and he had on these dark glasses. And by the way, there is no yeast in any of these stories. This is really true. So I was... Was I terrified? No, I don't think I was terrified. I thought we were going to be, lose our job, that's all. But he came in, and he sat down, and the entire board of directors, who were pretty famous people, were sitting along this enormously long table. And, uh, and Steve Ross said, uh, Mr. Erdig and Mr. Morris, we're here to hear your plans on how you are, in, what is your strategy to improve your business next year? And so, help me, Ahmed looked up and he said, Doug and I are going to get more hits. That's it. <laughs> that was it. It was like he was Peter Sellers in the movie Being There. <laughs> he didn't say anything else. Everyone else was mortified, I think, because no one said a word. There's a lot of wrestling of the papers. And, um, and finally, Steve said, well, thank you very much. And we got up and we left. <laughs> and I swear to you, this is exactly how it happened. And I went out and I said, you are fat shit crazy. <laughs> and he said, no, 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 we're going to get more hits. This will all be fine. And I, I thought we should just keep on walking. <laughs> but that's not the way it worked out. The way the story ended, the following year, we had our best year. We got a lot more hits. And that really is the record business. <laughs> and Jimmy? Tell us about Jimmy. That was a... That was a true partnership, but one based perhaps on friendship as well? Or but Jimmy really, it, it, well, Ahmet wasn't a partnership either. Ahmet, I worked for Ahmet. I wouldn't ever dare to say he and I were partners. He was just um, an amazing uh, record man and an amazing character. With Jimmy, we started with the Belladonna album that went number one, and we stayed friends for this 37 years. I speak to Jimmy at least twice a day. 
and he is the most remarkable person. And you can see now he's taken over the uh, digital part of uh, Apple. He built Interscope into perhaps the most prominent record company in the United States. Now here's where the legalities come in with the digital signing of streaming and what R. Kelly was talking about specifically when he said that his royalties were not given to him, that they had sold his music to Spotify, to Apple, and that that's one of the reasons why they chose to take it down because he wanted to get the royalties continually at the same rate that he had gotten um, before the, uh, the, uh, the allegations came out. And he said that they were going to pay him at the same rate. Um, with the pandemic coming, with the pandemic happening, which would be a year or two later, that would shut R. Kelly down from being able to make more music to a big mass of people as he would normally do, sold out concerts. Well, then what happens is the streaming industry wasn't making the money at first as fast as they would have if they had just bought tickets per each individual. And this is why I say that the pandemic plays a major role in how the technological music industry has now changed over. We couldn't have that many people in a six foot distance at one given moment. Um, so these are things that was going on in the industry that nobody really wanted to, to pay attention to, or maybe they did pay attention and it didn't make sense. But it really and truly makes sense. And he was fighting. He was going to fight for them to pay him all that he was worth. And they didn't have the money to do it. Not for one individual. Not for one individual. The same with Michael Jackson. The same with Whitney Houston. And and yeah, so this is what really was the backstory behind the allegations. Um, let's listen to perhaps the most prominent record company in the United States. And um, we're, we're not, we're friends, and that's basically what it is. And what about Barry Gordy? I mean, this is... Oh, he's a remarkable man. I think he's a freak of nature. He's 85 years old, and he goes out and plays tennis with guys who are 50 and beats them. And it's incredible. Now, this guy in 1958 started Motown Records in a, in a time of racial strife and... No money. I mean, it, it's like someone going out with no arms and no legs and building an amazing, amazing company. And think of the people that he signed. I uh, just speak from Michael Jackson to Marvin Gaye. To, it's just crazy. And I had the good fortune. We were friends. And one day, um, we were having lunch together. And I asked him, I said, why, why haven't you done the Motown story? And he says, I'm, too, I'm working on a show. I'm working on Ain't No Mountain High Enough. I said, really? He said, yes. So um, the next day, someone who worked for him called me up and said, did you enjoy your lunch with the chairman? They still call him the chairman. I said, yeah, except I think that he should be going to see a psychiatrist. He said, why would you think that? I said, because why doesn't he do the Motown story? I mean, that is a story people are interested in. And... Um, I said, maybe he's got some emotional problems with the story. You know, he had a child with Diana Ross. He was, most of the artists left when they got offered huge money by the majors. It might have had a, a, a bad feeling. The next day he calls me up, and I was a little concerned about picking up the phone. And I get him on the phone, and he says, Doug, I said, are you going to chill me out? Of course, I said, you should go to a psychiatrist. And he said, no, I just called you to tell you I'm making all of my appointments now. Come on over. And I went over to his house, and with a handshake, we just started to do Motown the Musical. And that was one of the great experiences of my life. Really fun. So, um, I'd like to change gear just okay. a little bit. Okay. Um, and um, focus on some of the big themes, some of the big issues that um, uh, are being discussed in the industry, but also here in mid -M as well. And first up, um, can I just talk about the debate about pay... Uh, or ad supported when it comes to streaming. What's your view? Pay, good. Ad supported, unless there's a conversion factor into a pay service, not so good. 
a company like Spotify, there's a hundred, um, a hundred streams equals a dollar. Say the biggest of the on-demand, ad-supported, 900 streams to a dollar. So you can tell which one we like. But I do think that this change to streaming signifies a tipping point in the music industry. Now, for all of you who are in the industry, I, I guess you realize that in the last 10 years, the industry has been actually halved. It was a $30 billion business. It's now a $15 billion business. Think about all the people who would love to work in the industry who can't. Now, what caused this? I, it was the disruption of a lot of other business, probably internet, piracy. I think ad-supported uh, streaming will hurt it also. Um, but I think that this tipping point will bring it back to where it was before. And the reason I say that is you need an example to base any conclusion, any kind of logic on. And the first mature streaming country was Sweden. And Sweden is back to where it was. Sweden is back to where it was 10 years ago. Now, there may be a lot of things that go on there that are easier for streaming in Sweden. But my guess is that slowly Europe and the United States will go the same way. And we will have an industry that is healthy, robust, and powerful. And the one thing that's very interesting about all of the streaming services that are controlled by the tech companies is that they don't work without music. That's very interesting. You can't have a streaming service without music. So we are really in a great position. Now, believe it or not, Jimmy ended up leaving his company after many years, and he's joined Apple as the head of Apple Music, which next week will um, announce their movement into uh, Apple Music, will be an Apple streaming company. Well, why not leave? You know that it's dying out. You know the company is dying out, Jimmy. Why not leave and go to the next big break, the next big situation that's going to catapult you into more money? But it's amazing how streaming was the reason behind the docu-series allegations and sexual uh, stories that were told on R. Kelly. And the sad part is Gail King, Jeronda Pace, um, um, Andrea Kelly, every one of them are coming back to say they're sorry. They lied. Someone lied. I don't know what happened. And they're not held in contempt of court. Such a sad state of being in the United States of America under the criminal justice system. Such a sad place and a sad day. Into... Uh, Apple Music will be an Apple streaming company. And I must say, Daniel Elk has done an incredible job with Spotify because pushing that boulder up that hill the way he did is just, where he's gotten it is an incredible, incredible accomplishment in my mind. Uh, for Jimmy, he's about the best marketer and the best music person you could ever meet. So he brings incredible knowledge to uh, Apple, they were very, very smart in, in getting him. But what do they have that gives them an advantage? Well, they've got in the bank $178 billion. They have um, 800 million credit cards. And Spotify has never really advertised because they're still not profitable. My guess is that Apple will advertise that they will make a big splash. Isn't some of this money old money? The old money that we're talking about is R. Kelly 30 years ago, 1994, 96, 98. Isn't he part of that money that is in the bank that I'm sure the old heads have put together and just interest alone, just interest and plugged it into Spotify. Don't think that they don't connect. Don't think that it doesn't happen. These big boys got some big old money. <sighs> and the result of this, I think it'll have a halo effect on the entire streaming business. 
all of the companies will benefit. A rising tide lifts all ships. And I think it has been the, um, uh, the beginning of an amazing moment for our industry. And I think everyone involved in the industry is going to benefit from these companies and that this I believe in the future most of the consumption of music will be done through streaming now it may not be as fast as we'd like because it takes a while to change people's habits buying habits but in my opinion it's coming and it's coming fast and um, after what we've been through for the last 10 years we all deserve some happiness because of course the industry um as as you pointed out, the industry has halved um, in the last 10 years, yes. from 30 billion down to 15. And you mentioned, of course, we're expecting Apple tomorrow, uh, I, I guess, to come out with... Well, the announcement will be, is tomorrow Monday? Tomorrow's Monday. And it's happening tomorrow. So, um, and so you talk about this tipping point, and um, uh, the, do you think the industry can get back to 30 billion as well? Is it... Is it able to get back to where it was, or is it going to be a more graded recovery? Well, if you look at Sweden, and what's the empirical evidence is there, Sweden is back to where it was 10 years ago. So my guess is, in a period of time, it may not be as fast as Sweden or Norway, but there's no doubt in my mind that this is what's happening. So you mentioned Apple, and I have to ask you about Steve Jobs. I mean, Steve was someone who you knew. Um, uh, uh, did he understand the music industry? <laughs> he certainly understood it well enough to sell millions of devices using the music. <laughs> so that's pretty smart. Yeah, yeah. Um, Steve Jobs actually came to my office the first time I met him. He had signed a deal with EMI. Uh, to use their music on iTunes, but Universal was the biggest company, and he desperately needed that music to really start his his business. And he came in and he lay out a program to me, from iTunes to the iPod, and what he was going to do. And I was so taken by him, I was shocked. He was so articulate. And the people in my company were really against leasing him the music because they thought it would open up the album. Well, they were right. The problem with their thinking was the album had already been opened up by the internet. We were selling, everything was being stolen. This guy showed us a way how to make money with digital music. Now, But yet they stole from the very beginning before it hit digitally. Thank God for the internet, because now everyone has a voice. You wouldn't be listening to R. Kelly Appeal TV right now if it was still back in the traditional times of Sony and the traditional music industry. In the record business, we spent tens of millions of dollars trying to create a digital system to sell music. None of them ever worked. We had one thing at Universal called Blue Matter. We spent because the universe is not racist, not sexist, not prejudiced. Anyone and everyone can be a part of the internet industry, the world, and no one person can ever conglomerate it because it's a unique system that was created long before the traditions of of racism even became. This is the thing that prevented a lot of us from being able to have small businesses. You know, this is the taxation department, but in a universal way where everyone can be and be given love and, and, and happiness. Thanks to the internet, their digital library could ha have been pirated just like they pirated to get everything that they had. Now the universal God is giving it to everyone for free. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that simply amazing? So R. Kelly... It's not in vain. Everything you did, everything you believed in, everything you said, it was not in vain. It, it, we're listening. We're listening. No one ever got it to work. So Steve did it with such grace and class. It was, it's amazing. So you've talked to, uh, so uh, it strikes me that you've seen, I mean, obviously you've seen the industry from both the content side and also the distribution side. What, in your view, is most important, content or distribution? Well, there's no comparison. You have no distribution without the content. 
I mean, without, let's call it a hit or music that people like, you end up with an empty slate and an empty disc. I'm Just like Doug Morris was when he started the history of how he became. All of his hits from 1950 to 1960, we didn't know anything about. Maybe it's because that was not our genre. Okay, but maybe some older viewers who are listening may remember all of those hits. But I don't remember Nan One, not a one. And I'm being sarcastic there. But I don't remember one. I don't remember one. How many do you remember? Before he started talking about Def Jams. How many do you remember? Never saw anyone distribute some music that people didn't like. Mm. That, it's just, it's it, actually, the only thing that's changed in the industry is the way we distribute music and the way we sell music. Now, people always say, oh my God, that's ridiculous. Nothing's changed. Well, nothing has changed. If you don't have a hit, you have a zero. You have nothing. So you, we're all slaves to the people, the brilliant people who are in touch with the culture and can spot an artist, can spot a record that's going to be important, that the people are going to die to listen to over and over again. And that's hard to do. And that's where we invest our money in these people. Well, you should have kept R. Kelly out. He would have been making number one hits today, today. All because of the lies that the industry couldn't pay him back to do. And he was working for free. He was working for free. That's why he wasn't able to pay his child support. That's why, you know, um, these allegations were hitting him. Yeah, because the docuseries put people to work. They got the industry moving again. They got book sales. They got um, consultation fees. Uh, fee services for these people who are supposedly victims to tell their stories to innocent individuals and they know they're lying. Oh my God. Completely. Let me keep going with the interview. Now we're approaching the end of our allotted time, but uh, just a couple of final questions, if I may. Um, first of all, um, of the, of the different things you've done in your career so far, what's been, in your view, the most important contribution that you've made to the industry? Um, I think it was taking on the ISPs. It was very interesting because one day I was watching my grandson. He was watching videos and he was watching an old video, I think it was called In the House, or it was a rap video. And I'm watching it, and I see this, this ad comes down, another ad comes down, another ad comes down. This video was seven years old. I'm saying, I wonder what we're getting paid for these videos. So the next day, I call up the president of our company. and says, how much are we getting paid for those videos? This was on Yahoo. And he said, nothing. And I said, why nothing? He says, we don't get paid for videos. They're promotional. I said, oh, what a ripoff. So I called... Terry Stemmel, who was the head of Yahoo, and was a friend of mine from the Warner days, he'd run the picture company. And I said, Terry, you're running all these videos of ours next to, you get next to advertisements, so are you getting paid? He said, absolutely. Well, what are you doing for us? I'm giving you great promotion. I said, I don't want any promotion. We have enough promotion. Stop with the promotion. I said, I want to get paid. And he said, and he's a lovely man, he said, over my dead body. <laughs> it, honest to God so I said well here's what we're going to do uh, we're going to take our videos off and we worked out a deal where we asked them for eight tenths of a cent for every video that they would show and they sent me back a very polite letter saying absolutely not so we took all the videos off all the ISPs and as soon as we did that it was interesting because Sony I was at Universal then I get confused sometimes with the companies but <laughs> <laughs> as soon as we did that Sony took theirs off and you could see, you could see their audience go down immediately 30 days later they call us and they everyone paid us so in that one month we turned videos which were a huge tens of millions of dollars of expenditures to promote the artists into a tremendous profit center which is increasing every day.
Hmm. And just because you can't be afraid of things. You have to go face them. We, I didn't get one artist complaint. The artists knew they were making no money from these things. And um, it was a wonderful victory for the industry. So if we could just close with maybe um, uh, a final thought from you in terms of words of wisdoms, um, some thoughts about um, what young people in the industry today should focus on in terms of their career. What would, what would your advice be to people starting out in the industry today? Well, first of all, you have to know what your talent is. Some people are good as recording engineers. Some people are good at publishing. Some people are able to identify great artists. Everyone thinks they know a hit. Very few do. You have to first look at what you think your strength is. And then you can't listen to the people who are going to tell you, don't go into that business, it's a dead end. You're going to end up starving to death. You really can't, there's a lot of naysayers who will stop you from living your dreams. And it's your life, so live it. Don't be afraid would be my, don't be afraid of anything. When you're doing something that you love, it's fun. And when something is fun, you actually get good at it. And that's my advice to anyone who starts in this industry. Do what's fun and what you love going to work and that you can't wait to go to work that day. And everything becomes very clear when you're doing it. And I think of my own career, which I, I can't get to work. I can't wait to get back into my office Monday to see what's happening. And that's 50 years later. So I'm the perfect living example. So thank you very much. So what are your views? What are your thoughts? I want to say truthfully that I have no problem with Doug Morris. I'm a business consultant. I know about business and I know about business moves. And sometimes you got to do what's best for you. However, when you take a person's life, when you take their livelihood, when you take their opportunities away, just because um, the powers that be that are surrounding that board table, that board of directors, that next um, profitable um, merger, we need to consider that these are not just ideas. These are human beings. So that's the problem I have with Sony. And I wish that Jennifer Bonjean had of went through all of this information. And I wish she had met R. Kelly in 2008 prior to this case, because a lot of it would have been on the books that it was a bunch of bullshit over royalties, that it was all about, it wasn't about the music, as he said. They were trying to reduce him to ruins and make him a homeless individual. Because what would he, where would he be right now without being incarcerated? He would be homeless. The R. Kelly, the king of R&B, because of how they muted and sabotaged his entire career. I thank you for liking, listening, joining, subscribing to this podcast. And we always update our information on the appeal process when we feel that something is important enough to share with you because we know your time is very valuable. But this right here was the making of the R. Kelly case. Archived interviews. This was the making of the R. Kelly case archived interviews and it was also about the royalties so thank you and as always keep it 100 and we'll see you next time